The second reading for this morning is from 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, which will serve as the basis for this morning's sermon. Here Paul writes, How can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy that we have in the presence of our God because of you? Night and day we pray most earnestly that we may see you again and supply what is lacking in your faith. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus clear the way for us to come to you. May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as ours does for you. May he strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus Christ comes with all his holy ones. The word of the Lord. Please stand for the gospel. For the gospel acclamation, the congregation will sing the refrain. I will speak the verse, and then we'll sing the refrain after the verse. Two. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey. The Holy Gospel according to Luke chapter 19. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the, at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, Why are you untying the colt? They replied, The Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put it on Jesus. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. The Gospel of the Lord. Jesus we'll sing hymn 301. You may be seated. <laughs>
In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, amen. Your brothers and sisters in Christ, hunting season is starting soon, and it hasn't started already. And usually when you're hunting, sometimes people are a little bit more hobby. They just go out to their stands and just wait for the deer to show up. But every once in a while, you find one of those who are very serious hunters. And they will look and they will find out, map out where all the deer are going and make sure it's just like, okay, I want to be right here or I want to get somebody over here so they can push the deer over here and then we'll get it. And you can figure this out all the time. You can have the perfect plan and you can have it all laid out. You're going out at this time, you're going to be here at this place and you're going to catch that deer. And more often than not, it seems like, okay, you expected the deer to be there, but they didn't show up. You can push them and chase them, and if you miss a shot or don't even have an opportunity, you're not going to get a deer. Sometimes you just have as much chance of getting one just by sitting in one spot. In life, we find that there aren't any magic bullets either. All right, There isn't just one plan that we can simply follow, replicate, replace it, redo it all over again, and you, you get the same result. It's what was going on in Thessalonica. In fact, actually, it's almost the exact opposite. If there was a plan to make a church grow, Thessalonica was not doing it. And it's not because of their fault. It's not that they were sitting there saying, like, well, we don't care about the word of God or anything like that. No. Paul had come to Thessalonica, and the word of the Lord had spread, and it was gathering much attention. And it gathered the attention of the wrong crowd. And people started persecuting Paul. Went after the person that he was staying, whose house he was staying in, Jason, and had him brought for stirring up and causing trouble. Started a riot, they did. People that were trying to persecute Paul. And eventually, Paul had to leave that area for fear of his safety. And even after Paul left, it would appear that there was still more persecution going on. And so you would think that if there was a plan to cause the word of the Lord to spread, having the guy who brought the word of the Lord there and chasing him off and then putting pressure on them, that's not going to work. And Paul was very concerned about this. That's why he's writing this letter to the believers in Thessalonica, because he's very concerned that between him leaving and now the persecution that they're facing, they're going to give up on this altogether. And so he was so overjoyed when Timothy came back with a report. How can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy we have in the presence of our God because of you? Night and day we pray most earnestly that we may see you again and supply what is lacking in your faith. All right? Think about that. Paul had genuine joy that they had not grown, not exploded, that they were surviving. All the pressure that they should have put on, that were being put on them. All the persecution that they were possibly facing. It would have made other Christians maybe give up. But not these. No. You see the work of God here. The work of the Holy Spirit. There's no way. It made no sense. And yet, they were there. And so, brothers and sisters, we're reminded, too, sometimes we might have a plan. Sometimes we might have our ideas. And you know what? Without God's blessings, it doesn't work. Without God's blessings, it could fall flat. And so, brothers and sisters, oftentimes we have to be careful. Because Satan, yes, he has a plan. He has designs. You can see the work of Satan out there going and saying like, hey, if we remove Paul, hey, if we put pressure on the Christians, this word of the Lord is not going to spread in Thessalonica. They're going to fold up shop and say it's not worth it. But they were growing. They went against the grain. All right? And yet, 
even when things are going well, Satan still has a plan for us, weaseling his way in there or not. And I would say, definitely focusing on verse 13 here, what was Paul's prayer for the Thessalonians? May he strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones. He wanted them to be blameless and holy in the presence of God. You see, because blame, there's a lot of that to go around. When things aren't going well, as it was in the case of the Thessalon Thessalonians, all right, there's a lot of blame to go around. Well, if Paul were here, he would know what to do. That could have been a temptation that worked its way in. They could have blamed whoever was causing the riots. All right? They could have blamed them. But thankfully, they weren't. Thankfully, they weren't. Sometimes, too, in our life, when things aren't going well, it's easy to blame people. And the prime example of that is just by going to the book of Job. Job lost everything. Job lost all his possessions, lost his children, lost his health. And then if that weren't bad enough, his friends are coming him and at him and blaming him. You must have done something wrong. Because God would not be doing this unless he were angry at you. There's a lot of blame to go around when things aren't going well. Sometimes we blame others. And we take a look at that and we say, well, I, maybe the person to blame, yeah, sometimes we blame ourselves too. Maybe we blame ourselves for mistakes that we really shouldn't be blaming ourselves for. Taking on more responsibility than we should. There's a lot of blame to go around. That's why Paul's prayer for the Thessalonians and for us is that we would be blameless and holy. Thankfully, there's no plan that we have to follow. Nothing we have to do to make that a reality. Jesus said, I'll take the blame. He took up the responsibility of your sins. He said, I'm going to pay for that all. He became your sin to make you holy. That's why he's entering Jerusalem this morning on a donkey, on a sign of peace. He's not here to conquer. He's here to make peace between us and God. Those are those wonderful things that we get to celebrate this season, that idea of peace that everything is right between us and God. No, everything may not be right in the world. You go out there, and yes, there's wars and rumors of war, as God said there would be. But between us and God, there's peace. Things may not be going well in my life, or in your life, or in another person's life, but that doesn't mean God is angry and attacking them. No. Everything between God and the Thessalonians, everything between God and you is at peace. He's on the same side. He's using those things once again to strengthen and maybe, yes, to bring you back to the word where, yes, he does that extraordinary thing through the ordinary, giving just those beautiful words of forgiveness in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Sprinkling a little water on a child. And their sins are forgiven. It's so ordinary. It's not flashy. And yet, it's where God does the extraordinary miracles. It's through that entry into Jerusalem, through the little babe in Bethlehem, right? Something small, something so ordinary. And yet, he makes us blameless and holy. And gives us peace so that we might have genuine joy. Not joy that is manufactured. Not joy that's going to be there for a little while. All right? Maybe some of you are celebrating a victory. That lasts for a day. 
After mourning a defeat that lasts even shorter. But there's nothing that's going to keep that joy that's going to keep going. We always seem like we have to manufacture something to keep that joy bumped up. Instead, the genuine joy that we have is that the word of the Lord is spreading, the word of the Lord is growing, and that, yes, he is supplying what is lacking in so many people's faith. He does that again and again through his word. And that Paul here is rejoicing over that, boy, let, us, let that be our joy too. That the word of the Lord is spreading. Maybe we don't see it in some areas, but in other areas we do. And that the Lord is, word of the Lord is spreading all over to the world to places we never thought we would ever reach. And so, brothers and sisters, as we see that the joy and peace we have from God here, then what can we do? Let's go back to verse 9. How can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy we have in the presence of our God? We can't ever do enough. We're never going to be able to hit that moment and say, we've done more than enough. But that doesn't mean that we need to despair or get worried that we can never do enough. No, we do what we can do. We can do that by showing love here, as he talks about in verse 12. May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other, for your brothers and sisters in Christ, and for everyone else, not just your brothers and sisters in Christ, right? Not just your brothers and sisters in Christ, but other people in the world, including those you may not get along with, especially those you may not get along with. Here Paul is saying to that, yes, there are people who are attacking you. Yes, there are people who are causing riots, and they are trying to silence you. And it's easy to find fault and blame in them. But let's see it for what it is. It's Satan. It's Satan manipulating and twisting their hearts, twisting their actions. So maybe the simplest way to reach out for them, to spread God's word, isn't in some big, grand, wonderful gesture, but in those little things, in those ordinary things. Reading those who you may disagree with, having a conversation with them, about anything, having a conversation about what's at the heart of the conflict that you might have. Once again, that's Christian love. And no, we'll never be perfect in this life. We will never reach that moment where we can say we have loved exactly like God has loved. Because just when we think we've hit that point, we find there's more to it. There is a greater love, there is no greater love than this, that Jesus gave himself up for us and for our sins. And so, brothers and sisters, we may have plans. We may think we have magic bullets to, bullets to fix all the problems that we have. And none of the things, none of the applications said here this morning are those. They're not magic bullets. But what we do have is a God. A God of Joy, peace, love that does the extraordinary through sometimes the most ordinary means. And that he, well, what is he going to do? He's going to do the miraculous. He's going to make us blameless and holy in the presence of God and our Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones. Amen. Please stand. And the peace of God, which goes beyond all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We'll now confess our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only God eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. 
for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord is the giver of life. We'll continue with the response of prayer of the church on page 7. You may be seated. And in our prayers this morning, we give thanks on behalf of Brandon and Brooke Onspaugh, who were blessed with the uh, gift of a baby boy this past week. We pray. Gracious Lord, you sent your Son into our world to destroy the power of Satan and restore the human race as your children and heirs. Work in us during this Advent season so that we may rejoice in the coming of our Savior and long for his coming again. Use the preaching of your holy law to rid us of all delusions that we can gain your love with our own efforts. Move us to realize how hopeless we are because of sin and to feel sorrow for what we have done wrong. Lift up our hearts to see the King who comes to save. Reveal to us his willingness to take on our human form and to stand in our place. Show us the power he extends in his word and sacraments to make us your children and keep us in faith. Thrill us with his promise to come and take us to our eternal home to live with you forever. As we live with Christ and trust in him, move us to turn away from sin day by day and with the strength your Holy Spirit provides. When we fall, forgive us and renew us to love and serve you and all people. Protect us from the distractions that come at this time of year, even in gift-giving and celebrating. Keep our hearts focused on Christ and his forgiving love. Move us to share with others the most important gift of the season, the truth about Jesus. Even in busy times, lead us to pray for those whose joy is diminished because of sickness, pain, or loss. Give us opportunities to provide help to those in need. We thank you, Lord, for the gift of life and for your power and promises that preserve life. We thank you for giving and blessing both Brandon and Brooke Onspa with the birth of a baby boy. Help parents to be models of your love. Make your church a fellowship of encouragement and admonition to foster growth and godliness in this child. We ask this in the name of Jesus who welcomes little children. Now hear us, Lord, as we pray in silence.
loving Lord, work in us during this Advent season so that our joy may be genuine and may rest in the promises of the King who comes to save us. Out of thanks for the peace that God gives us, we now bring our offering to his glory. We'll continue with the sacrament on page 8. Please stand. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, whose way John the Baptist prepared when he called people to repentance and pointed to Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. Lord God, you are worthy to receive thanks and praise from all people. You created the world and all who live in it, and in your mercy you saved us. We give thanks to you for the grace of your Son, Jesus Christ. Though in very nature God, he took the nature of a servant and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. He offered himself as a sacrifice for sin and redeemed us from its curse and penalty. He rescued us from the terrors of death and restored eternal life with you. He conquered our enemies and gained for us the kingdom of grace and glory. Bless us as we receive your son's body and blood and lead us to remember his suffering and death and resurrection. Forgive our sins and fill us with the hope of new life in heaven. Hear our praise and receive our thanks as we worship you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
we pray the prayer our Lord has taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We pray. We give you thanks, O Lord, for the foretaste of the heavenly banquet you have given us in the sacrament. Through this gift you have fed our faith, nourished our hope, and strengthened our love. By your Spirit, help us to live as your holy people until that day when you will receive us as your guests at the wedding supper of the Lamb, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. You may be seated for our final hymn. Once again, good morning and welcome to each and every one of you here this morning. Just a few announcements before you head out on your way. First of all, uh, today we're going to be helping decorate the church for Christmas. That's going to be taking place at 1 p.m. today here at church. Uh, just you have to show up, come ready to work. That's all I, all I ask. Thank you very much. Also, uh, coming up this week, we have our first of three Advent services or two Advent services plus the uh, early childhood Christmas service. Uh, and they take place at 7 p.m. Wednesday, starting Wednesday, 4th, 11th, and 18th. Uh, the uh, theme for the first two uh, Wednesdays in Advent are going to be Christmas trees. I know, just like we're decorating the Christmas tree at 1 p.m. today. We're also thinking of the trees that come at Christmas, and then we'll be talking about the tree of rebellion there in the Garden of Eden on at, on uh, Wednesday, December 4th. Also, Christmas for Kids is coming up a week from Saturday. Please sign up this week to help us out with that. Um, and then, one more thing, it always seems to happen when I leave town that there's a round of text messages or emails that get sent out of people pretending to be me, uh, asking for gift cards or money. Once again, I may ask you to help or serve via letter or email uh, that way, I might ask you to serve, but I will never ask for money or gift cards via email. So just, and 
I know some of you might say, we know this, Pastor. Good. There may be others who don't. You have to say it seven times in order for it to sink in. So I think this is like the fifth round. So if you know people that are connected to the church, because this, this round especially, we had somebody who was more church adjacent. Just remind them, I'm not going to ask for gift cards or money via text message or email. Otherwise than that, God's blessings to you. Have a safe and blessed week in the Lord.